But all right, this last video is from Game Maker's Toolkit. Love this channel. Uh, it's titled Valve's Secret Weapon. And apparently this is very much related to uh, the claim timer issue that we're seeing in Star Citizen right now. So uh, I was sent this. I was thinking about watching it, and then apparently it's very relevant. So let's see. About a year into the development of Portal, playtesters kept giving Valve very similar feedback. Something along the lines of, that was a great tutorial. I can't wait to play the actual game. Mm. Uh, slight problem, that was the actual game. Despite playing through 14 or so handcrafted puzzles, players were clearly missing some vital element that would tell them this was, indeed, a video game. And okay. so after a lot of discussion, Valve decided that the game needed an antagonist, someone to push back against the player, to provide motivation to keep moving, and to put these puzzles into context. This was all training in order to defeat a boss. The end result was, of course, GLaDOS, a loopy AI overlord with a biting, passive-aggressive wit. Mm -hmm. She teases you, taunts you, tricks you, and the whole game leads up to a climactic one-on-one -on -one showdown in her central chamber. Well, you found me. Congratulations. Was it worth it? Because despite your violent behavior, the only thing you've managed to break so far is my heart. Thanks to sharp I mean, writing and on killer stream. voice acting, she has become one of the most iconic video game villains of all time. But, says Valve's Robin Walker, her genesis begins with a straightforward process of us trying to solve the core gameplay problem in Portal. Now, if you ask me, the fact that GLaDOS may never have existed if it wasn't for this feedback just goes to show the value of playtesting. Yeah. Not to be confused with quality assurance, that's for rooting out bugs, or focus testing, that's for market research. No, playtesting is simply watching people play through a chunk of the game, sometimes mm. with a questionnaire or interview. I'm starting to see the relevancy. There is a very big difference between finding bugs and playtesting. And unfortunately, Star Citizen is not a game in which we are even allowed to play test because unfortunately people will get upset because there's too many bugs. Therefore, we're not allowed to play test what the features of the game might actually look like. For example, punishments for death. Um, you know, I don't agree. I, again, claim timer is not the best thing in the world, not the best decision making in terms of punishment for your ship exploding. But the argument against punishments for your ship exploding being bugs is not necessarily the best because we need to find out how the game plays. ...at the end, and then using what you see and hear to drive changes in the game's design. For example, if Valve sees that players are routinely getting themselves killed when trying to redirect these energy balls, perhaps they should make a change, like having it so you can only place portals on walls that are way above the player's height. And so on Portal, this approach was used to touch up almost every aspect of the game. Mm. Valve used playtesting to make sure the learning curve was perfect. They used it to remove moments of frustration, to make sure players noticed key objects, to improve the pacing, to tweak the difficulty, and to ensure the storyline was coherent. Playtesting even led to the game's iconic visual style, with those sterile white walls and floor. Originally, the game featured cluttered and grungy environments, but playtesters found it hard to oh, identify wow. the key puzzle elements. In one test, a player spent half an hour trying to push a shelf onto a button while completely ignoring a nearby box. Kim Swift, one of the key developers on the project, calls playtesting the most important thing that we learned since coming to Valve. You see, if you didn't know, Portal started life as Narbacular Drop, a student project made at DigiPen University in Washington. Wow. They were invited to show the game off at Valve's headquarters, and about halfway through the demo, CEO Gabe Newell stopped the presentation to offer the entire team a job. That's Their goal crazy. was to remake the game in the Source Engine and within the Half-Life universe. And to help, Valve introduced the small student team to its game development process. Here's how it works. You start with a goal, perhaps in this case to make a puzzle that is clearly readable and satisfying to solve. You then take a stab at reaching that goal by designing something, in this case a test chamber. 
Next, you evaluate whether your design reached that goal by doing a playtest. And if it doesn't meet the grade, change the design and repeat. Valve keeps going with this iterative process until it is no longer excruciatingly painful to watch the playtests, says developer David. I mean, I imagine it's excruciation, excruciate, excru, oh, I can't say that word, excruciatingly painful to to watch people play Star Citizen right now as developers of the company. Because I think that they know where um, things are meant to be or meant to go, and they know the steps that they have to take to get there, but they're never given enough time to do it because they're constantly releasing, right? So everything's always feeling kind of subpar or whatever, right? And then you you know, players get frustrated and then they probably get frustrated with us because we're just like, man, what the heck? But I've definitely been in scenarios where, uh, especially in the early days of certain missions or locations at Star Citizen, where it was very much uh, square peg, round hole stuff, and that that feedback eventually made things a little bit simpler for people or whatever, right? And I think we do have like a better, like wider range of like simpler things and more complicated stuff. But I think that this is, again, it, it's such an interesting look at arguing like the problems with this uh, live service alpha thing where Star Citizen's just out there and it's never being, I, I don't know, I don't know how to describe it, but it's never being properly play tested the game. Like so many of the core features aren't there. And that's sort of my argument behind adding things like punishment for ship death, punishment for player death. Uh, obviously, you lose your players like armor or things like that. They're all openly lootable. Uh, something similar should happen with our ships. You know, that's sort of my argument there is apply the same aspects to your armor that you apply to your ships and vice versa. And... Um, we don't have that, right? So that's just like a small example. But cargo hauling, uh, the economy, all these things are just not there. So players have never tested Star Citizen. So like the argument of like, but we need to test, we need to test, we need to test. We're not testing Star Citizen. You're testing like the puzzle piece that makes Star Citizen, like a salvage contract, right? Or a bounty mission. You're You're just testing these small little puzzle pieces that have yet to be tied to the greater whole that is the game, which doesn't exist, right? Yeah, so basically it's just testing our patience. Hey, <laughs> good one. But yeah, it's very interesting of how important playtesting is, but we haven't even gotten to that point yet. Spyro. Fantastic. You remained resolute and resourceful in an atmosphere of extreme pessimism. Perhaps, given the subjects of its most famous games, it's apt that Valve sees game development as an engineering problem or a scientific study. Valve's former in-house psychologist, Mike Ambinder, says, We see our game designs as hypotheses, and our playtests as experiments to validate these hypotheses. Interesting. Now, it should be said that playtesting is by no means exclusive to Valve, and indeed, every game developer sources player feedback at some point in the process. But the difference is that Valve is obsessed with it, to an almost religious degree. Ambinder calls playtesting the most important part of the game development process. Gabe Newell calls it our secret weapon. And a designer who joined the studio in 2018 said, I always heard that Valve does a lot of playtesting before I came to work here, and I was not prepared for the amount of playtesting this company does. And I think Star Citizen probably does more than that. We're constantly playtesting. I think the problem here and the disconnect between what Valve is doing and, and we're like in our brain, we're going, well, why can't we do that? Is we don't know the timeline. Um, we don't know how long it was from the development, play, the first play test to the end results, right? And, and all everything in between. And uh, exactly what Nexi Dave says. The problem is, is they don't listen. I don't think that is they don't listen. It's that they take forever to implement that feedback or what feels like forever. Guys, I talked about mining and the problems with it four years ago. 
four years ago, and I even spoke to developers about it and was told, you, like, we agree with everything you're saying. Four years it took for somebody to prioritize that and make it happen. Right? And that's the part that we're like, dang, this is brutal. So how do we speed up that process? I think CIG is going, well, throw more developers at it, right? Like each split up all these teams. They have ownership over their little things and they need to make them better. The only result we've seen so far of an improved star citizen or improved CIG right now, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but it's with the mining mechanics. It's maybe with how salvage came into fruition and how quickly it has come from just hull stripping to now cargo removal to uh, via, uh like tra uh, tractor beaming stuff off right like you could start to see that things are getting better and that play testing might actually be working but it's still not working at a pace that matters to any of us because we're still just play testing the little puzzle pieces. We're not play testing the big ones. And again, that's why I make the argument of, guys, if we do not add the core of the game of Star Citizen, then we're in trouble, right? Taking and going to Squadron 42 and saying, you know, we're going to polish everything over there, not play testing, and then bringing what they feel is good enough over to Star Citizen to be final? No, like that's when it needs to become a play test, right? Is I think that this is where we need to take the good and the bad. Hopefully those features come over a lot more polished and then hopefully they actually want to play test them with us, right? For example, master modes, uh, the new quantum travel. To answer your question, Sharp, that sounds like a good deal the the um that sort of stuff is where i see it and and where we're not at yet and and that's why i argue that i don't think uh reclaim timers for your ship are a good thing because you you just have the player sitting there doing nothing that's good play test feedback that they're not listening to right is they're ignoring the fact that the system is flawed in the first place Right. And they're not adding, which they could easily add now, the actual consequence of uh, maybe losing your components or having to pay to, to return those components to your ship. I think Elite Dangerous does that. Right. There are very core elements of the game that could be added and could be properly play tested. Uh, you know, economy. Hey, guys, for this play test, everybody starts with an Aurora and watch how people progress through the game and make money, right? There's no play testing going on. There's just, uh, it's just like another marketing tool almost is what it feels like it, as a player, right? Is you, you, you're play testing the individual things, but the actual game of Star Citizen, just a, uh, just a marketing tool still. Valve does play testing early. Swift and her team started running playtests of Portal after just one week of starting to build the game at wow. Valve, even though they only had one half-finished room to show people. And they do it often. Portal was playtested practically every week. They'd do a playtest on Friday, discuss the results on Monday, apply the lessons the rest of the week, and test again on Friday. It sounds extreme, but I think this devotion to playtesting makes a lot more sense when you learn about the disastrous development of Valve's very first game, Half-Life. About two months before Half-Life was supposed to ship, Valve realized that the game... I think what's really special about this video is they're, they're kind of taking us along the ride and showing us their playtests. I think maybe Star Citizen needs to open the door and show us more of that. You know, open development things... You want us to show us the process of game development, as you're always saying. Uh, this would be, I think, a real win of showing us what a CIG internal playtest does. How long are they doing it? How often are they doing it? Things like that. Well, sucked. The developer said you couldn't play the game all the way through, 
none of the levels tied together well, and there were serious technical problems with most of the game. As a whole, the game just wasn't working. The only real option on the table was to scrap the whole thing and start from scratch. But this time, they would do things differently, which led to two game development philosophies that are still present in the studio today. One is the idea of the Cabal, where the staff is split up into tiny, multi-discipline teams who each take complete ownership of a small chunk of the game. But the we other is frequent playtesting from the very earliest point of development. This time, if the game sucked, they wanted to know right away. So about three months into development of the restarted Half-Life, they started. It, it almost feels like if the game sucked, they still release it anyway in Star Citizen and just drop it. And then just say, oh, well, okay. Playtesting. They found we know. random gamers and they in get video mad game when shops we say and contacted people who filled in those little registration cards you got in old PC game boxes. They'd sit them down in front of the game and just watch them play. Each test would result in dozens of things that would need to be fixed, changed, added, or deleted from the game. Like, after watching some playtesters break every crate in a level, Valve realized it probably needed to stuff some of those boxes with goodies like ammo and health packs. And this new process obviously worked. This version of Half-Life was a huge success and is now seen as one of the most important and influential games ever made. And apparently I look like the main character of that game. As such, Valve would use playtesting extensively in all of its future games. On Half-Life 2, Valve planned to give out the gravity gun towards the end of the game, but players loved using it so much, the team decided to make it available much sooner. On mm. Left 4 Dead, playtesters found it hard to find teammates who were in trouble, which led to the X-ray outlines of your fellow survivors. And on Portal 2, a paint type that let you walk on walls was scrapped when it made multiple playtesters feel queasy. The arrival of Steam allowed Valve to go further, converting millions of online players into post-launch playtesters. When Steam's data showed that lots of players were getting stuck in Episode 1, they released a patch to reduce the difficulty of a tricky siege battle. Plus, playtesting was instrumental when exploring an all-new technology, virtual reality, for Half-Life Alex. How was Half-Life Half Alex? It seemed like one of the best virtual reality games that like was ever out there. For instance, Valve learned that a player's tolerance for standing around watching people talk was significantly lower in virtual reality, so had to speed up the game's pace. Player behavior helped us navigate VR development, says yeah, Valve's really Christine good. Phelan. I, I don't you have VR, think so of I the never tried as it. another designer. There is barely a moment in the game that wasn't improved by what playtesters told us and showed us through their play behavior. So, from Half-Life 1 to Half-Life Alex, playtesting has been an invaluable tool for Valve. So I want to share some tips from the developers to show you how to playtest more effectively. Though, it should be stated, Valve is not like other companies. From its unorthodox organizational structure to its near-infinite resources, there are very few companies on Earth who can copy what Valve does. And also, this approach may work best on super linear, extremely handcrafted story games. And other techniques, like heat maps, may work better for other types of game. But with those caveats out Maybe of the MMOs. way, perhaps their experience can still provide some useful guidance. So, tip number one is test early. Valve says playtesting is where we make the vast majority of our most important changes to our game, so we try to do it as early as possible on the project to get the most value out of it. When you identify a problem early on, you have time to go back to the drawing board and develop an effective solution to the problem. But do it too late, and sometimes the only way to fix a problem is with a flimsy band-aid solution, like, uh, I don't know, having the characters just tell you the solution to a crummy puzzle. Valve may start testing within a few days of prototyping a mechanic or designing a level, even if it looks hideously ugly with programmer art or bright orange textures on all the walls. It doesn't but this matter. actually helps them avoid wasting time on other aspects. There's no point investing heavily in art or audio if the game mechanic is going to be completely changed or cut from the game entirely. Number two is test often. Valve typically tests every single week to make sure they are constantly iterating on player feedback. This also leads to a huge amount of data. Each Half-Life 2 chapter had about 100 playtesters, for example. What games are Valve working on now? And that mass of information can be invaluable. By having a huge number of people look at the game, Valve can look for common trends in the feedback 
and avoid tweaking the game based on a few weird outliers. And the more experience CS2, you have yeah. seeing people interact with your designs, the better you'll get at preempting this feedback in the future. Gabe Newell says, after you've watched a couple hundred playtests, you start to develop a much better sense of what are successful and unsuccessful design strategies. So, some famous lessons learnt at Valve include players don't learn when stressed and players don't look up. Number three is <laughs> shut up and watch. A playtest should try to simulate the actual experience of playing the game, which means the observers need to stay quiet for the duration of the test. No hints, no guidance, no answers to burning questions. Nothing is quite so humbling as being forced to watch in silence as some poor playtester stumbles around your level for 20 minutes, <laughs> unable to figure out the obvious answer that Siege of Orison was probably the best example of that uh, with Star Citizen for me. I, I think Siege of Orison was very brutal at the start, and I think it it got a little better. I'm not sure the solution with the voice lines constantly telling you what, like, oh, oh like, oh, go here, don't do this, or, you know, um, not the best. I mean, it's such a big area. I feel like Siege can probably improve from that even still. You now realize is completely arbitrary and impossible to figure out, the studio has said. Post-game interviews and questionnaires can certainly happen. Those were instrumental in solving the GLaDOS problem, after all. But you'll often learn more by watching players than by talking to them. Swift says they may tell you later that they like the game, but you'll really tell by their body language whether or not they actually enjoyed themselves. Mm. It's also a common game design trope that playtesters like to offer potential solutions to the problems they face. But as they don't have insider knowledge of your vision, and this is where Star Citizen, like, they feed off of this, and I think it's really not good, is we're all constantly giving solutions to the problem, and I, I, it drives me insane to listen to it. Like, it's not so, we should not be given solutions to the problem. We should be saying that this isn't fun, or this is, and that's it, right? And, and why we feel it's not fun or why we feel it is. These guys have the insider information of knowing what's possible, what's not possible, what resources they have, and so on and so forth. But very often, Star Citizen community members, um, especially streamers and, and YouTubers, are often giving the solutions instead of saying, hey, these are problems. Like, I don't enjoy Star Citizen because there's no progression system. I want you know, and expect, you know, in an MMO that is expected to last many, many years to provide me with things to reach for, things to grasp onto, and things to that are challenging to try to achieve, and that take time, and that take effort, and multiple steps, and I don't have that in the game, and therefore, I don't enjoy Star Citizen as much as I probably should. It doesn't, ex it doesn't exceed my expectations, it doesn't even remotely meet them at this point, and you know, the things that I feel are lacking from it are like, you know, economic reasons to do anything, um, progression reasons to do anything, and so on, right? So that for me is like the type of feedback that I would give. And then feedback on certain missions would be, uh, you know, like what I said about Siege of Orison or feedback that I've given around mining, well, you know, was basically like, hey, uh, this isn't challenging enough. You seem to think it was, but it may have been challenging to someone who doesn't play the game very often, but for somebody who does, you've just made it easier. Instead of making things like, you made an already easy thing easy when you thought you made a challenging thing easy. And you would only know that by get, gathering the feedback and watching the playtest and watching us literally obliterate an 8K rock with, with ease, right? On, in a prospector and then you know the other feedback was moles aren't good enough like there's no reason to use a mole my next feedback would be the mole is being used as a solo ship there's no there's and that's not fun to me why would i use a prospector i love that ship i want to use it it's it's like one of my favorite things is these solo ships should have roles and the prospector 
it should be there. And then the mole is something that another player is using as a solo ship, cargo haulers, all these things. We're allowing players to buy huge ships, pi pilot them in the verse now. And then what are we going to do? We're just going to take it away from them later. Everyone's going to hate you. You should have had that stuff in the game in the first place, right? or constraints, these solutions are usually better left ignored. Number four is designers should run playtests. Valve does not outsource testing to a special department or uh, leave it with a publisher. Playtesting yeah. is done by the people who are actually responsible for the design and execution of the level or mechanic in question. The That's where streams are awesome. And the designers come to the streams all the time and watch me play their stuff and... Uh, yeah, it, it's like a very similar concept. Cabal from earlier. This shows the developers exactly what needs fixing and can give much needed motivation to improve the game. And play. Great example of this and still so frustrated that this was taken out of the game. For some reason, I have no idea why. Uh, way back in the day, WTF Asaurus constantly at Security Post Korea all the time, nonstop, because... It was he was more of an FPS player, not much of a ship combat guy, and it was a place to have FPS combat in Star Citizen. Luke Presley's watching him play on a regular basis every day at Security Post Korea and watching how he played. And he was constantly running around, turning the doors inwards so he would know he would hear somebody coming in. And you can hear the direction that it was coming from. So Luke took that room that is on the upstairs, if you're facing the, the terminal in which you hack, upstairs. So now it's it's uh, basically where the, uh, the evidence locker is. There used to be a room above that. And he put it, he, it was a security room. And he put this panel there that would show what way a door was facing and which door was opening. Yeah, it's just a vent above the, that room now. And Soros would sit there and watch the door swap and then would go and kill the player coming in right they removed it i don't know maybe it was too overpowered or something like that but that was like a perfect example of watching someone play and being like oh wow this would be really cool to have that solution there uh for for that their behavior might inspire new puzzle solutions or ideas for the designers watching like in half-life alex players would instinctively cover their real-life mouth to stop Alex from coughing and alerting a gigantic blind zombie named Jeff. So Valve turned covering your mouth into an actual game mechanic. Wow. Number five is get the right people. Valve gets feedback from a huge variety of different playtesters, from fellow staff members to little kids to pro gamers. But it's learned to always have a target audience in mind when making changes. Like, when Valve was figuring out how to make a climactic boss fight against GLaDOS, they initially got feedback from hardcore FPS players who said the level needed more action, more challenge, and more skill. But this idea was a dud. When facing this tricky boss fight, says Eric Wolpar, the vast majority of playtesters who had gotten used to the slower-paced, cerebral nature of Portal were just frustrated, confused, and dissatisfied. Okay. They still wanted to satisfy those hardcore FPS players, but did so through optional content like portals, advanced chambers, and challenge maps. Number cool. six is to challenge your assumptions. Okay, so maybe the GLaDOS boss fight didn't need to be a test of skill. So perhaps it needed to be the most complex puzzle in the entire game. Yeah, Surely that would everything. be a suitable climax. But here's the thing. Playtesters thought the game's midpoint escape, that bit where you use a portal to avoid falling into a pit of fire, players thought that was incredibly climactic and satisfying, even though it's basically the easiest puzzle in Portal. But <laughs> Valve realized that the time pressure, the visual impact, and the high drama all made it way more exciting to players. Very so interesting. So maybe okay. they were overthinking the final boss too. We've been holding on to this idea that we need a complex puzzle at the end, and it simply wasn't true, says Swift. And so they settled on a pretty simple sequence. It's very easy for game designers to make wonky assumptions about how players will act. I recently made a whole video about doing this in my own puzzle game. I'll drop a link to that one in the end screen of this video. Perhaps the most important tip though, is that playtesting feedback is just data. 
and it's up to the designer how that data is interpreted, filtered, and applied. For example, Half-Life 2 originally had a very short introduction before Gordon Freeman grabbed a gun and started shooting. Playtesters loved it. Who wouldn't be excited when jumping into the action? And so, given this good feedback, it would be easy to keep the game exactly like that. But despite the positive sentiment, writer Mark Laidlaw says Valve decided to keep working. They thought it would be better to delay combat. We wanted you to witness the cops doing something horrible and feel like what you were doing was a response to that, not that you were just a killing machine, says nice. Laidlaw. And they thought it would lead to a better emotional payoff if you had to wait a much longer time before finally getting Gordon's iconic crowbar. Oh, and before I forget, I think you dropped this back in Black Mesa. Good luck out there, buddy. Here's the thing. Playtesting is as useful as you make it. If you just bend the game to the whims and desires of every playtester who comes through, you'll end up with a dumbed-down game or bland, designed-by-committee sludge. But if you go in with a clear goal, a specific game you want to make for a specific audience you want to entertain, and then you- Jeez, what is that for Star Citizen? They want to cater to everybody and do everything. How is that going to work? We're screwed. Is playtesting to validate whether you are hitting that goal, you can use this feedback to unlock the incredible game you are trying to make. Oh, don't click off. I've got one last portal story while the Patreon credits roll. So, the invention of GLaDOS is actually not the most dramatic change that Valve has made in response to player feedback. During an internal game jam held shortly after the release of Portal 1, a bunch of Valve developers came up with an experimental puzzle game called F-Stop. In this game, you use a camera to take photos of objects. Then you can spawn that object elsewhere in the world, perhaps at a completely different scale. Gabe Newell loved the concept and said it should be developed as a follow-up to Portal, meaning each game in the series would feature a different piece of technology developed at Aperture Science. But after nearly a year of development, playtesters were very vocal in their feedback. Portal without portals just didn't work. Yeah. And so Valve decided to scrap the game and start Portal 2 all over again. In recent years, we've been able to see what F-Stop might have looked like as fans have used leaked assets and code to make various recreations of the game. Cool. But Valve never returned to the concept. If you want to play something similar, then check out Superliminal or wait for the upcoming photography puzzler, Viewfinder. Thanks for watching. Cool. Yo, that was great. I mean, just apply that to so many levels of star citizen it's just crazy um yeah it's just like we it's what it's what frustrates me the most about the game is we are play testing they do get feedback from us on all these little pieces but if we never get the core aspects of the game and truly play test those like what it's like to properly earn money in the game for real reasons if we never create money sinks if we never do these things we're never really play testing star citizen are we we're just play testing a mission here a cargo hall there mining over here and we have to start adding whatever the core of the game is we don't know devil's chariot and and going from there right and i think one of the worst examples right now which hopefully will turn into the best, like I said earlier, is something like Master Modes, really polished over in Squadron 42, brought to the player where it's in a state that can really be given feedback and tweaked and things like that. But I think the issue with Star Citizen fans, again, like we said earlier, is we give feedback and then it's literally years, years of time before our feedback is actioned. And that's not good. Uh, for a situation where your game is live and playable now, right? And that's the thing that I struggle with the most is is you want to see that feedback actioned much quicker. And I think we're starting to see that a little bit more with, um, you know, the quick updates to mining, um, you know, the modules not being able to be moved around. Hey, this is a really bad experience. Instantly changed it. The explosions. I was sort of happy with those a lot and you know what and i know that my feedback is not for the majority of the players mining 
right? Where you mine a rock in the green zone, it blows up and it blows off your components. Terrible, right? Terrible experience for people. They changed it as quickly as they possibly could. So there's tons of shining examples of where this stuff works. But for the core of Star Citizen and, and talking about things like uh, the economy or uh, refueling or uh, claim timers, they never seem to properly play test that stuff because the community gets up in arms and they instantly back off and say, oh, oh sorry. Like, no, man, we need to start putting these things in the game and we need to start actually play testing them regardless of the bugs in the game, right? Economy, punishment for death, all that stuff. That's where I'm at. But that was a great video. Wow.